Come on. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the things. I haven't heard that song in years. <laughs> he just uh, sat up and went. Uh, you're very welcome back. Yes, the kids are back to school. So we are free to talk about sex. Historical sex. But here's uh, your warning. Get them out of the room if they're not in school, uh, which they... Yeah, probably should be. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, mightn't want them to overhear anything, but here to talk all things history and sex is sex historian Esme Louise James. Good morning, Good morning. Esme. How Good are you? Good morning. I am so excited to be here. It is so fantastic. You are, your job is sex historian. We're talking about kids going to college at the moment, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. How did you become a sex historian? Well, I went to university originally to study the history of religion. So I think this is testament to how <laughs> off track <laughs> that initial plan went. Yeah. Um, but there is definitely a bit of a Venn diagram between the study of religion and sexuality and experiences that bring people together. And I veered off pretty quickly. I did everything I wasn't meant to at university, basically. So yeah. in trying to find out about the kinky history, the name of your new book, where do you find the material and the information? I'm very lucky that there's obviously a great um, uh, tradition of historians who've done incredible work. And a lot of these stories come from the margins of history books, those little pieces that we don't focus on as much. It yeah. comes from letters and diaries from these great historical figures that if you go through them with fine tooth pen, you know, you find the kinky erotic parts. <laughs> because it's not like sex is new. We're all here for millions of years for a reason. So this sort of fascination with sexuality, what people could do, pleasure, mm -hmm. it goes back millennia. Uh, well, we wouldn't have a history otherwise, yeah. really. Through, <laughs> yeah. Which is such a fascinating part of, you know, we speak about so many other aspects about what it means to be human. Um, and sex is such an integral part of that. And there's a great disservice we do to understanding the human experience if we don't speak about this part and how it can influence us. OK, well, let's go back because <laughs> this was news to me. The oldest sex toy is older than the creation of writing. It is. So the pen was used before the pen was used for... We the, have the, priorities. Okay. How? What was the first uh, the sex toy? pen isn't toy? mightier yeah. than something no. else, I'll tell you. <laughs> the oldest sex toy that we know to date is now 28,000 years old. <laughs> and that's it. We have a picture of it there. <laughs> it is quite a wonderful discovery. You can see there it's, um, you know, quite phallic in phallic. shape. A uh, ring at the top. And in the uh, quote from the research study, it said it was highly polished at the top from overuse. And if that's not the most fabulous phrase I've ever read in a research paper. Um, and, you know, we, this isn't the only one we found from the ancient world. We have ones uh, 10,000 years ago. It was in a German cave. Yeah. But don't worry, we found some on, uh, on uh, Irish soil. So you're part of the long-standing history of the dildo. <laughs> hey, we like Ooh. to be... We li we li Brooke's over there going, yeah! yeah. <laughs> Uh, we like to we like to claim things as our own. I never thought we'd be claiming the dildo. No, absolutely own. not. Fantastic. Well, tell us about Irish history, <laughs> sex history. Well, as I've been walking around Dublin over the last few days, I feel like it's a disservice not to talk about one of my favourite figures of all time, uh, Mr. James Joyce, yes. who features quite heavily in kinky history. Really? Uh, he, right. he does. Uh, because obviously, you know, uh, we're so proud and uh, like to venerate the work such as Dubliners and Ulysses. Mm -hmm. But James Joyce is also very talented at writing a series of erotic letters to his wife. And what makes these so amusing to undergraduate students are, they're not your kind of typical erotic letters. Okay. Um, he has a reverence for his wife's backside, namely the sounds and smells that she can produce from it. So we have a series of letters by James <laughs> Joyce in which he is describing um, how much he desires the girlish farts that go pop, pop, pop out of her girlish bum. And no way. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and he goes into great detail about uh, the different kinds of sounds and smells that she can produce. Um, and, you know... <laughs> Nora. Nora Barnacle I mean, from Galway. Fair play to Nora. I'll tell you what, romance is alive and well in our house. And if that's <laughs> assume that this was where Ed Sheeran's uh, Galway girl was uh, about Nora Barnacle. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I'm wondering who you're talking about with the pop, pop, pop in hey, your house. OK, hey, you course. better say it to you very quickly. <laughs> he's pretending not to really know <laughs> James Joyce's letters, but no, he's uh, ha know. has them memorised. Say it again. Great What's time. that called? It's quite beautiful. Um, uh, uh, Nora, um, the big fat fellows, the long windy ones, the girlish farts that go pop, pop, pop out of your girlish bomb. I hope that you let off no ends of farts so I may always know their smell. Wow. There you go. That is. <laughs> that, that was. Um, <laughs> Beautiful, okay. uh, beautiful. Well, that's it, interesting. Yeah, there you have it. It's funny. It's you know, funny. it is, and it's an integral part of who we are. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's one thing that we've really kind of lost in this moment in history, that James Joyce, when he is writing these erotic letters, at the same time, there's a kind of joy and silliness that happens. And he's not the only figure, you know, Mozart writes um, endless uh, canons and songs also about the joys of the backside. And they're all done very tongue in cheek. You know, there is a sense of fun about how silly. <laughs> I love your face right now. Tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek. Um... <laughs> But the, Which the... cheeks? I don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what? Like, these were, like, uh, private letters mm. to his wife mm -hmm. talking about her farts. Yes. Like, do you know, maybe they didn't want the public to know this stuff. No, I think yeah. when they were sold to Cornell University in uh, the 1957, there was a bit of a, a shock and horror when they were initially published. Yeah. Um, and I think there's... And I speak about this at kind of length in the book. What does it mean when a great historical figure who, um, you know, we see as this kind of mastermind genius, yeah. and we talk about this part of this silly erotic part of who they are. Mm. And I think there's something that doesn't detract from how incredible this person is, but it reminds us that they were human yeah. too. And that you have this sense of um, sexuality and joy and pleasure that's so integral yeah. to every single part of who we are. In the book, you cover so much and the, and the historical nature of it, but of course, pornography, consent, mm -hmm. Uh, is such a huge part of today's mm -hmm. conversation and what's happening. Absolutely. It, it's all tied up with history as well, though, because porn isn't anything new. No, not at all. And I think that's um, a very uh, common misconception that we have. Uh, but my uh, PhD really focused on how pornography first emerged in the 18th century um, as a literary genre. And one of the things that when we start writing uh, pornography in the form of pamphlets and uh, smutty novels, um, one of the things... Uh, about it is that it always used to be very political. It was about uh, describing authorities and, you know, famously the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette was such a common target of pornographic pamphlets. And it was about critiquing authority, about making a political statement through bawdy, silly, pornographic media. Right. And what I think but is... But it's like now with AI, how they kind of take a woman's power away yes. by, by creating a pornographic image. Absolutely. Wow. And there's still so much that I think, you know, when we have in these modern conversations about AI and um, the effects of revenge porn that we still need to learn from history. Because if that's how the genre began and this is how it's still being used, what can we do differently to stop this from happening to, you know, women especially who are so part of this target? Tell you what, everything's wow. happened before, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's all history. Sure. Um, you wrote this new book, Kinky History, um, with your mum. I did! <laughs> Australians, <laughs> I love you. You're mad. Who was that? Um, it is one of the greatest privileges of my life to get to write mm -hmm. a book such as Kinky History alongside my mum. And when I talk about the most amusing dinner conversations you can have at the family dinner table, it's writing this book. The messages that I would get from my mother being like, hi, honey, what are you doing today? I'm looking at fart letters. What about you? <laughs> um, you know, um, very, uh, very out of context letters that I would get from my mother. But so she worked on a lot of the contemporary research yes. that's in the book. Yeah. She's a statistician and yeah. I'm incredibly proud of her. And the point about putting this together is that if you're going to have conversations about history and what we need to learn today, we have to put the present into that conversation. So did you talk about sex with mum? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Can you imagine writing a book called <laughs> Kinky History and not talking about sex? I know, but it's not a bit awkward, no? No, I know. I think... At the start, it is very awkward. You know, um, we've now worked together for really about four years uh, in this area. We have uh, did a series with Screen Australia called Sex Statistics, all about looking at uh, how statistics can tell us about our sexual identity behaviour uh, today. And when you initially start this conversation with 
anyone, there is this sense of awkwardness and this sense of kind of breaking down the boundaries. But I'm really proud that we've been able to practice what we preach. If we're saying that talking about sex is important and we need to be vulnerable, we're able to also do that through the process of writing this book about our stuff on social media. And it's just made this really joyful, productive relationship. You are a joyful human being. The book is called <laughs> Kinky History. This is by Esme Louise James and you are taking part in the Kink Live event with our very own Jenny Keane tonight wow. at uh, the Sugar Club. Tickets are sold out though. Obviously. They are, I'm sorry. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. Really? You, what would we talk like, about? What, like, what do they talk about, yeah, I wonder? Oh, it's this closed be... room. We can't tell you. Right. <laughs> I hope, very you know what? Jenny always makes them go red and so have you. So yeah. I hope you chat about that a little bit. This is the name of the book. You have been an utter joy. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> they were all human at the end of the day, isn't that right? Nice to know. Um, Esme Louise J uh, James, thanks so thanks much so for coming much. in. Thank Best you so much tonight. for having me. Pop, 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 Blake Lively? Wonder does she pop, pop, pop? She all, we all do. We'll be finding out in fashion, yep. Uh, and we're going to find out what's uh, in the cinema as well. Also, we'll stop come there. here now and then. Yeah, talk to you in a minute.